Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the third webinar in our series, COVID-19 in Context, News Coverage and News Literacy in Uncertain Times. I'm Sunshine Menezes, the Executive Director of the University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute. Today, we'll be discussing digital forensics or how to fact check like a pro. We're bringing you these webinars in partnership with the News Literacy Project, a nonpartisan national education nonprofit that navigates, the, sorry, that provides educators with the tools and resources to teach their students how to navigate today's complex information landscape, uh, as well as to learn to judge the credibility of information for themselves and become engaged and informed participants in our democracy. Metcalf Institute's mission is to engage diverse audiences in conversations about science and the environment through webinars like this and by providing education, training, and resources for journalists, scientists, and other science communicators. On behalf of Metcalf Institute, I'd like to thank the Ruth and Hal Launders Charitable Trust for supporting this series. We've all experienced the unprecedented challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, from our personal health, both physical and mental, to our social networks and society at large. This disease is testing our governance, public health, and economic systems, among others. As we all try to come to terms with and make sense of the daunting scientific uncertainties about the virus, we're also facing one of the most urgent science communication challenges of our time. This four-part webinar series brings together journalists, news literacy education experts, and scientists to explore these science communication challenges. Each of the webinars will be posted on Metcalf Institute's YouTube channel, and we'll share that link in the chat. After today, we'll have one final webinar in the series on May 5th that will be about how to make sense of scientific uncertainty. You can also see the link in the chat to register for that last program. Building on the 10 critical news literacy skills discussed in Tuesday's webinar, we will introduce you today to some of the tactics commonly used to spread misinformation. We'll also show how to use free online tools to debunk false content like a pro. Leading us through this discussion is Peter Adams, Senior Vice President of Education at the News Literacy Project. Peter began his career as a classroom teacher in the New York City schools through Teach for America. He is also taught in the Chicago public school system at Roosevelt University and at Chicago City College's Wilbur Wright campus. He also worked with the New York City Teaching Fellows Program and with After School Matters as an independent education consultant. Since joining the News Literacy Project in 2009, Peter has coordinated classroom and after school programs, served as the Chicago program manager, worked on organizational strategy, developed the News Literacy Project's digital program, and led news literacy training and workshops for educators and others. He was promoted to his current position in January 2014 and now oversees the News Literacy Project's education team, which develops resources and training for teachers. He and the other team members are all based in Chicago. And with that, I am happy to turn this over to Peter so he can tell us more. Great. Thank you, Sunshine. Um, it's great to be with all of you. Um, I think uh, you got a pretty concise uh, overview of what the session today will be about um, and a little bit about NLP. Uh, if you want to learn more about who we are and our mission to see news literacy really integrated and embedded in the American education experience, uh, you can visit our website at newslit.org. We have resources there for you as well. Um, we also have a weekly email newsletter called The SIFT. Um, there are three issues left in this school year. Uh, it runs during the school year and we will be back in September, but if you want to check out our archives uh, or subscribe to that newsletter, it is there as well. Um, so I'm going to dive right into to some examples of misinformation. I've tried to organize this session around misinformation about um, the pandemic and about COVID-19. Um, some of you have probably heard that on February 2nd, uh, the WHO uh, declared uh, the uh, novel coronavirus pandemic uh, an, uh, an infodemic as well. So there is a massive infodemic that is 
running in parallel with the actual physical pandemic. Um, and they define that as an overabundance of information, some accurate and some not, that makes it hard for people to find trustworthy sources and reliable guidance. And here are some examples of uh, the inaccurate uh, information that's circulating early on in the pandemic. Um, this has calmed down a bit, but we're still seeing it. Um, there are a lot of, uh, of cures, um, false preventative, you know, false cures, false preventative measures like garling, gargling with salt water, vinegar water, lemon, ginger, all these sorts of uh, home remedies to sort of wash the virus out of your throat before it can infect your lungs. This is entirely false. Um, and it gets repeated and iterated in different kinds of text-based rumors. So these text-based rumors sharing some of the same uh, 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 alleged but false cures or prevention measures were circulating pretty broadly early on in the pandemic, um, largely because I think people were trying to share what they thought was helpful information, but in fact, this could be quite dangerous. Um, and people actually, you know, try this. So one big lesson I think is to remember that as easy as social media platforms make it for us to like and share content, um, it does have an impact, right? If, if you share something that's not true, it can make its way to someone like this who actually tried the quote self-diagnosed test that I, that I had up here a minute ago. There was a rumor that if you could take a deep breath and hold it for more than 10 seconds, uh, it means you don't have the virus uh, and that's not true. Um, uh, so that could lead people to believe they are not contagious when they are, if they, if they are. Um, and so that could be very, very dangerous. Um, uh, other text-based rumors uh, have circulated just uh, last week uh, or 10 days ago. Um, this rumor uh, that Trump said, quote, hundreds of governors are calling him. Um, and uh, of course, you know, we have 50 plus some governors in territories. Um, uh, but this is false. So Trump did not say that. Here's, in fact, what, what fact checkers think he said that, that was the basis for this rumor too bad but we could have given you saw the statements we have hundreds of statements hundreds of statements including from democrats and democrat governors and if you look yeah, so they were all saying we need ventilators we need you don't hear from democratic governors or democrat governors um uh, so this circulated pretty broadly you can see this one was shared 179 times but that rumor made its jump from facebook where that original uh, instance i screenshotted it came from over to twitter um, and one remarkable thing you'll notice is that uh, some of the, uh, most of these are actually um, copies of the exact same text. So you can see hundreds in all caps. You can see the, the double period after him quote period uh, in multiple instances of this across the web. So if you just search that phrase, you can see that people have just copied and pasted the text over and over and over again. Um, and that is not necessarily evidence of, of automated or computational uh, uh, coordination. Um, it may be, but it also could just be hyperpartisans sharing a message and copying it and broadcasting it through partisan groups or, or other means. Um, another rumor that circulated, obviously, uh, there have been a lot of conspiracy theories about uh, the pandemic. Um, one of them early on uh, was that hospitals were not as busy as they said they were in New York. Uh, and that they were using mannequins to stage a pandemic. So this is a variation on a, on a false flag conspiracy theory. Of course, this is entirely false. Um, this is a, a picture uh, from the Defense Visual Information Distribution Service. Uh, so you can see here the picture um, uh, of, of uh, military medical personnel wheeling a mannequin um, on a gurney, what they are uh, practicing uh, for the, the USNS Comfort, the, the, the uh, medical ship that pulled in uh, at New York. Um, they were practicing transferring patients, they're practicing protocols. The use of medical mannequins is actually very common. Um, and so pictures of medical mannequins were going viral uh, to, uh, as quote, evidence, but false evidence that uh, the pandemic's being staged. Um, this actually just circulated uh, recently. This was yesterday, posted yesterday to Twitter. You can see it's gotten 4,500 retweets, 4,100 likes, um, and uh, purporting to be London on lockdown, um, preparing for, you know, anti-5G protesters. This isn't London uh, uh, at all. That's in Malaysia, um, uh, in a city uh, called Selayang Baru. 
that's uh, actually going into a lot portion of that city is going into physical lockdown because they've had an outbreak that they're trying to contain. Um, the recent uh, reopen America or anti quarantine protests have also prompted a lot of misinformation. Um, signs are very easy to Photoshop. So you can see here a tweet um, with a protester holding a sign that looks like it has a crazy conspiracy theory. So, you know, Barack has six letters, Hussein has seven letters, Obama has five, that adds up to 19, COVID-19, open your eyes, right? Um, this is almost certainly was created as satire, but it began to circulate uh, uh, with, you know, as an authentic image, people believed it and they thought this was an actual protester sign, um, but it's not, it's a fake, it's a doctored sign. Um, as many of you know, signs or pieces of paper are incredibly easy to, to doctor. So here's the original. She was actually holding a sign that said, give me liberty or give me death. Um, and this was in Huntington Beach, California at a, at a recent protest there. Um, here are some more uh, signs. These, these were actually shared and used as the lead image on a verified account um, and, a, and a lead image on a story on their website. Uh, the signs did not say you know, protect my right to die, defund science, hands off my ignorance, my virus, my choice. Uh, they actually said, you know, fear is the real virus. Uh, this cure is deadlier than COVID, reopen Colorado now. Um, so these were uh, folks outside of the Colorado State Capitol building in Denver uh, on April 19th. This was taken by a Getty photographer named Jason Connolly. Um, but those signs again were doctored. And again, likely in a satirical fashion by whoever did it, but once it started circulating, it was mistaken for authentic signs uh, and used in a partisan manner. And, and, you know, people engage in something called confirmation bias. So if they see something that resonates with their biases, if they think that they're against these protests or they think they're misguided, uh, they might lean into that and not really scrutinize it. So we have to really uh, stay on our guard and, and um, be aware of our own biases and the way we're responding to information that we're seeing um, this image that I have here, a, a man holding a, a swastika flag with the, with the name Trump above and Pence below, circulated on Reddit as taking place in Lansing, Michigan. Lansing had one of the first, I think maybe the first, anti-quarantine protests. Uh, I believe it was on April 15th. Um, and the implication here is that this person is an anti-quarantine protester. Um, and in fact, there were some, some uh, controversial and, and offensive signs uh, at that protest. This is an authentic picture from the Lansing protest um, with a woman holding a sign that's comparing uh, Governor Whitmer of, of, uh, of Michigan um, to, to Hitler or to a to Nazi regime. Um, but this particular image uh, is out of context. This was actually from a March 2nd uh, Bernie Sanders rally in Boise, Idaho. So when you tell them if that's, oh my God. Spare you the volume here. So what there's is a raw this? cell phone video uh, on oh, YouTube sorry. from that day posted on uh, March 2nd. Yeah, it might be the day after the, the, the March, uh, there at the end of April, beginning of March uh, in Boise uh, in support of Sanders. This is before obviously that he, he dropped out of the race. Uh, the gentleman holding the sign later in that video comes up and tells a, a, an anti-Trump joke uh, rather distasteful one uh, to the woman who's who's filming the the Bernie supporters. She is there in counter protest um, uh, and uh, has a conversation with him. So it's clear that he is in fact not a not a Trump supporter. He was a Bernie supporter or a Trump critic uh, and was holding up that sign uh, in, in that uh, uh, in that spirit to, to send that message. Um, so. Uh, 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 there are some interesting parallels between um, a physical pandemic and what we're seeing online in play out with this infodemic and the spread of misinformation. And Charles Seif uh, wrote a book called Virtual Unreality. Um, and in the uh, introduction to the book, he makes the comparison between uh, you know, the epi epidemiological parallels between the way physical viruses travel and the way information travels. And there are three main factors to, uh, that drive an epidemic or a pandemic, um, how transmissible a given virus is, um, how persistent it is, so how long, for example, it could live on surfaces, which we've all read and thought and worried so much about, um, and then how connected people are, how close together they are. 
Um, and, and the same is true, I think, of, of, uh, of information, and he makes this case in the introduction. So we live in a time when we can transmit information from one person to, to many thousands, potentially, you know, hundreds of thousands at the click of a button. It's, uh, it's incredibly easy. Um, that information is very persistent. Everything on the internet is potentially forever. And we are you know, more connected than ever before. Most of us are active on multiple platforms with multiple followings and different audiences. So you can imagine uh, if our virtual world were our physical world, <clears throat> how much more widespread the, the, the novel coronavirus would be. Uh, that's kind of what we're dealing with on the information front. Um, that sort of draws it into focus. So the parallels here between the pandemic and the infodemic, you know, a pandemic thrives on unsuspecting people who aren't taking precautions. <clears throat> 20 seconds, as we've learned, goes a long way. Wash your hands. Um, social distancing can help stop the spread, flatten the curve. Uh, and that's important because your choices affect others. So uh, even if you don't catch the virus, you could transmit it. Um, and even if you, uh, uh, you know, don't get sick, um, uh, you could still spread it to others. And it has the potential to overwhelm our medical infrastructure. We saw that in Italy. Uh, we worked very hard not to have that happen again here um, uh, in New York, especially the parallels to the infodemic then also thrives on unsuspecting people. So if a piece of misinformation plays into your biases, um, if your guard is down, if you have a strong emotional reaction, you are vulnerable um, uh, to, to falling for it and even spreading it. 20 seconds of checking goes a long way, as I hope to, to make the case for, the, for that. Um, just taking a moment to check the comments, do some lateral searching, check for a fact check, uh, goes a really long way. And if we can stop misinformation or flag it for others, uh, respond in a comment with a fact check, we can practice our infodemic version of social distancing to stop and stop the spread and flatten the curve of the, the, the spread of, of what is really potentially dangerous or even life-threatening viral rumors. Um, and it is uh, overwhelming our information infrastructure. So fact checkers right now are completely overwhelmed. Um, but uh, one difference is that uh, there is no vaccine available yet uh, for COVID-19, but there is uh, a vaccine available for misinformation. And that's to uh, you know, learn to be more news literate and to be more uh, savvy when it comes to digital verification and fact checking. So that's what we're gonna dig into um, here's that announcement from Snopes, by the way, on March 20th, that said uh, that uh, they are overwhelmed. It's overwhelming their small team of fact checkers. There was too much misinformation circulating for them to get to. Um, and I think that makes the case about uh, for, for why we all have to sort of step up and, and be more savvy and play a role to help clean up the information landscape. The fact checkers can't all do it on their own, um, but we can use some of the same skills and tools that they can here. So before I pivot, I don't know if there have been a question uh, uh, come up um, that we want to take, Sunshine, or if you want me to move on. I thought I would pause here as we pivot into to this next section. Sure. Um, thanks for um, checking, Peter. There, there are a couple of questions that I'd like to touch base with you about. The first one goes back sure. to that, um, that screenshot that you shared uh, regarding the a purported statement from Trump on social media, the hundreds of governors thing. And mm -hmm. um, so someone says, what tool did you use, Peter, to capture and trace the multiple posts that get the copy paste effect across multiple accounts? Uh, so I just searched for the, the, the phrase, uh, the, the original viral phrase on Twitter and got, you know, hundreds of results. So I just screenshotted some of those and put them into a uh, compilation. Great. Um, um, and I think that you're going to get into this, but I'm going to um, test the waters with this question. What can, sure. should we do when we see doctored images like these on social media? Do we reply with factual information, such as that video is not from London, it's from Malaysia? Um, this opens us up to all kinds of online harassment. So what other solutions are there mm. other than reporting to the platform on which we see it? It does. I think so. First, that's a very good point. Um, if you're comfortable responding, I think it's important to, to do that. Um, uh, clearly, reporting, reporting content is a great first step. If you're, if you're comfortable replying, that's also great. Um, tagging in fact checkers uh, or forwarding it to Snopes 
forwarding it to um, uh, the folks who cover the, the disinformation uh, environment. There are other fact checkers, lead stories, factcheck.org, PolitiFact. They all uh, kind of have open DMs and open messages and you can email them examples. So that's also a really good idea. Um, and then if you have a, you know, an anonymous account, if you want to get into this, but you don't want your personal account engaging with purveyors of misinformation um, and people spreading chaos online and, and potentially get trolled, uh, you could use a separate account to, to do your responding if, if you, you know, feel strongly enough, if, but also don't want to engage with your personal account. Great. Okay. I think we can move on at this point. Thanks. Okay. Great. So, um, I'm going to move through five skills uh, to, to, as we said in the title, kind of help you fact check like a pro. So this is a, a lot of what professional fact checkers do uh, at a very basic level. So this is just an, an introduction, but you'll see how powerful these five things can be uh, um, in combination with each other. So first, you know, I'm going to draw on the examples that I just that I just went through. Um, this example of the fake Trump quote: um, If we do some lateral reading. Uh, we just can uh, search the phrase, you know, Trump said, and the beginning of this quote to try to get to our answer. So uh, the fastest route here, if you're, you know, if you're on a, a, a computer using a browser is to hit control T and do a quick search, or just open your Google app if you're on your phone, do a quick search. And you can see right away, we have um, Reuters, PolitiFact, Snopes articles right up top um, uh, that will help us understand what we're looking at. Google even pulls in, you know, PolitiFact's rating here, false in the actual results. Uh, clicking through will help you understand why it's false and PolitiFact will show its work and be transparent about how they know, but at least you have that um, uh, initial uh, rating there right in front of you. So it's, it's, it's literally, you know, five or six seconds away uh, in the time it takes to type uh, the beginning of the quote, you can you can have an answer. So um, lateral reading is actually something we really need to reinforce with teens. So as, as you all probably know, the News Literacy Project works mostly with middle school and high school students. Uh, and so it's a major goal of ours to make lateral reading, opening a new tab, doing a quick search, uh, a habit of mind for them. I mean, there is maybe no more powerful first step you can take after you sort of pause, gauge your emotions, don't need your share then do a quick search. Um, so there are some related skills here, um, click restraint. So, you know, if you do do this search, then look at the results and scan for credible sources, fact checking organizations, uh, standards based news organizations. Um, the top result may not always be your best one. Um, uh, look for standards based sources, not user generated sources. Um, lateral reading can also help us go upstream to the source uh, of information. We'll talk more about that seeking a source that can give you more information like a caption under a photo and so on. And then I've already mentioned, you know, control T being just a, a, a really useful time saver um, uh, if you're on a desktop or a laptop. So I'll pause there. If there are any lateral reading questions, that was a very, very basic, you know, uh, uh, rundown of, of uh, why lateral reading uh, is important, but I know there are a lot of folks on the line who work with students um, and and uh, academic librarians, I see a question about that. So I know you've probably engaged these questions as well. So if anyone has a question or something to share there. Um, so someone asked about a list of lateral reading sources, a go-to list. Is this something that NLP has on your website? Uh, <clears throat> no, we don't have on our website. Um, I guess, it, you know, when it comes to viral rumors, if you're, you mean, you know, websites to check um, check if, if, if something's been debunked. Um, you know, the fact checking organizations that I mentioned at the, at the top, uh, you know, Snopes, obviously, PolitiFact, factcheck.org. There's a great fact checker, leadstories.org, uh, uh, AFP, fact check, Agence France Press uh, um, uh, has a wonderful, more globally focused fact checking organization, full fact, um, it's a more European focused fact checking organization uh, as well. Great. Um, uh, someone also asked about a, a clarification on standards based news sources versus user generated. Sure. Can you clarify that? Uh, sure. So, uh, you know, a standards based 
source of news is it would be from a news outlet that that aspires to some kind of journalistic standards. Uh, generally speaking, you know, most institutional media aspire to a common set of standards around fairness and, and have verification uh, uh, baked into their process uh, and they're accountable for mistakes. So they correct mistakes uh, and, and note that, uh, which is very different than say a blog that's authored anonymously. So just helping students understand the difference between a standards-based source of information something that you know has been either peer reviewed or subjected to a, a, a verification and editing process uh, as opposed to something that uh, has just been posted directly to the web um, either by someone who who does put their name on it or or anonymously okay great so so one of the questions was an ex asking for an example for teens of a user generated source so like a blog oh. would be a good example yeah or almost you know a lot of what you see on social media would be user generated right so the claim many of the claims that i just went through are pieces of user generated content in fact most, well, almost all of them are um, shared by someone we don't know on youtube shared to TikTok, shared to reddit to instagram to twitter um, uh, and then they circulate from there right um and one other question here uh that is a tricky one uh, lateral reading and verifying information with sources like Snopes, Fact Check, et cetera, is great for those who trust those sources. Right. What do you suggest for those who believe that those very sources are part of the problem? Yeah, I, that's a that's a tricky one. Um, what I generally recommend is, you know, first of all, if someone Snopes tends to get more of that than other fact checking organizations. I think they've been around longer. They've become a partisan target. Um, is to, you know, use a different fact checking organization that doesn't uh, sort of trigger that response if you're working with a particular student or group of students. But you can also dig into the to the fact check itself. So when Snopes or PolitiFact or, or any other fact checking organization publishes a fact check and debunks a viral rumor, they don't just say that photo is fake, trust us. Um, they actually show you how they know why it's false. And so that's where the richness lies. Even if you read the Snopes piece uh, or read the PolitiFact piece and then take the links that they use uh, to prove something is false and just share those instead of the original fact check. So you can just share a link to the Getty image saying that picture is false instead of the Snopes or the PolitiFact entry showing that that protester photo is false, for example. Great, that's a great example, thanks. And then one last question for you before we go on to skill two. Several sure. people asked for a little bit more um, context around uh, click restraint. And one person summed this up very nicely. They wrote, I liked the way Peter described what click restraint means behaviorally, as in don't do knee jerk sharing. But can we hear a little bit more about how to communicate what restraint is and how people can practice it, maybe noticing emotional reactions, yeah. et cetera? Yes, uh, so I guess there's sort of two, two aspects of click restraint. The, the context in which I mentioned it with lateral reading was exercising click restraint in search results. Um, and I think a great exercise if you're working with, with uh, young people or students that you're trying to, to, to uh, engage around news and information literacy um, would be to just do some Google searches on your own and take screenshots of the results and ask students you know, where the credible results are. And if you do a strategic search that gives you a blend of kind of user generated dubious sources, obscure sources with some more credible sources, uh, especially if those credible sources come further down, um, that can be a good exercise just on a slide. That's a great bell ringer. If you're a middle school, high school teacher, that's a great icebreaker opener if you're uh, in a lecture hall even. So um, that's one form of click restraint. The other, what you're talking about you know, is is not sharing um, recklessly or or in a in a knee jerk fashion, as I put it. Um, I think I think a great starting point for that, honestly, is to help them understand the business model of social media platforms and and so called ad tech. So you know, Facebook and Twitter and TikTok uh, and and Snapchat uh, and Instagram all want you to stay on platform. That's how they make their money. Um, and if you engage with content and leave their site. Um, then, you, then you've left, right? YouTube, same way. Um, and so 
Uh, that's how you know you get caught by the YouTube algorithm late at night when you're supposed to be doing something else and it keeps suggesting videos and the next thing you know an hour has gone by and you've been served how many more ads than than you would have if had you just come to the site and done what you intended to do. So I start I would start there helping them understand here's the business model. They're they're monetizing your attention. Um, they've built algorithms to keep you there and to keep serving you content that you like that will keep you there so they can serve you more ads. Um, but it's free, so that's the trade-off, but they should know that, right? Um, and then that helps them also think about the architecture of those sites. So Twitter, Facebook, they want people to engage and part of engaging is sharing. So they want you to share and they want to make it as easy and quick as possible in their user interface. Um, they don't say, are you sure? Like if you click share on Twitter, you don't get a modal that says, hey, are you sure you really wanna share this with your X number of followers? That might be a great thing for the information environment, not a great thing for Twitter's bottom line. So helping them understand that those are purposefully designed to be frictionless, to be easy to do for a business, you know, to, to, to serve the business model of those platforms is a great way, I think, to introduce the notion of click restraint when it comes to sharing. Great, thank you, Peter. Okay, let's move on to skill two. Right, so um, web archivers, and some of you may have, may have used uh, the Internet Archives Wayback Machine, for example. Um, and I thought I would use this example from this past week. I didn't open with this, but uh, as many of you know, um, uh, earlier um, uh, in the week, uh, Vice President Pence um, visited the Mayo Clinic and, and did not wear a mask uh, and received quite a bit of blowback online about that. Um, and um, despite what you may think, uh, there was also a, a, a quite a bit of discussion on Twitter about a tweet that the Mayo Clinic uh, allegedly sent and then deleted. Um, and this is an authentic tweet, um, but if we were using this uh, as, a, as a point of exploration, um, it can be kind of difficult to verify, right? Here was a tweet that circulated. Some people screenshotted it. Um, screenshots of the tweet are circulating, but if you go to Mayo Clinic's feed, it's no longer there because they've deleted it, right? So how do we know whether or not this is a fake uh, or not? And fake tweets are actually quite easy to produce. Um, and this is something that, you know, before I show you, I always caution educators and others to be aware that these things exist. And I think it's very important that we all are aware that fake tweet generators exist and other social media fake generators exist, um, but not to use them to realize the stakes that, you know, using this to circulate, even what you think is a joke, as I think I've demonstrated, can get loose and go viral and create real confusion. So this particular site, TweetGen, uh, and there are many, lets you make a fake block notification, a fake suspension notification, or a fake tweet. And it basically works like this. So if I were to, and I didn't, but if I were to make a fake Mayo Cl uh, Clinic tweet, I didn't actually generate the image, uh, you can actually fill in the name, fill in the handle, decide that to make it a verified user, and then just steal the profile photo from the authentic account, put it on the fake tweet, and there you have an image that looks like a genuine tweet from the Mayo Clinic or anyone else. Um, and, and then you could circulate that as a screenshot online. So you see people do this quite a bit. They make things up. They make an incendiary false tweet uh, or false social media post and circulate it and say, look at what this person um, posted and then deleted, but I saved a screenshot and it was a tweet that never existed. So the challenge here is figuring out, you know, what's the difference, uh, you know, how can you tell whether you're looking at something that was faked as a screenshot or something that is a legitimate authentic screenshot of a tweet that actually was deleted. So anytime you encounter a, a claim about a social media post and all you have is a screenshot, not a link, you have to be really careful. Um, some of them are authentic. Many of them are not. In this instance, this is authentic. Um, and if we go to Mayo Clinic's feed, obviously it's gone, right? So if we scroll down and, and move through this, you can go past the date and time that that screenshot was posted and see that it's no longer in the feed. Um, so the way we would uh, next look for it is to use a web archiver. So uh, archive.is is one. Um, and it lets you save uh, a URL that is currently live in that red box at the top. Um, so if you post a URL there to a specific tweet, you can save that tweet. It will time and date stamp that um, and save an image of that. That also goes for any, any content online that, that, uh, that can be screenshot. So you can actually save what 
you know, the homepage of the New York Times looks like right now, if you ever wanted to refer back to the way it was laid out or a particularly good story or, or what, for whatever reason, um, it also helps, you know, if you're an educator and you want your link to remain stable, if you're worried that something might be deleted later and you want to use it in a lesson that you might use again next year, for example, you can archive the link. Um, another way to use archivers is to grab pictures of web pages that you don't actually want to visit. Um, if you don't want to give them the traffic or you're unsure if they're safe, you can copy the link address by right clicking the link. So this is an example of a, of a what is actually a fake news or fabricated news site uh, created by a, a guy named Christopher Blair, who, who is a liberal self-described liberal troll. So he publishes outrageous falsehoods to try to get conservatives to react online. And then he and his cronies make fun of them, um, which, is, which is unproductive in so many ways. Um, but if you don't want to give Blair the traffic for this, uh, this fake story about the Clinton Foundation, you can right click the URL and copy the link address in your right click menu and then paste that into the archiver. And then when it gets a screenshot, you now have a stable image and you don't have to go visit that site if you're unsure about it or you don't want to give it um, the traffic. Um, so uh, we can find um, uh, this screenshot of the Mayo Clinic uh, tweet uh, in archive.is. Um, and uh, I thought I had a video of myself doing that. I guess I didn't, didn't make it in. So at the bottom box here on archive.is, if you uh, enter the URL of what you're looking for and click search, um, it will come up if it's been archived by someone else. Uh, and if you enter um, the stub of a URL with an asterisk behind it, it will give you any URL that begins with that stub. So twitter.com slash Mayo Clinic slash asterisk, for example, would pull up uh, any and all um, uh, content that has been uh, archived uh, by someone. Oh, actually, here's the video. Here's, so here's what you can, oh no, that's the video of me scrolling through. Here's what I just described. So I'm going to look to see if there are any archived uh, tweets from the Mayo Clinic using archive.is. So you can see there, I just typed, let me back up just a second. Sorry about that. So I just typed the stub of the URL here. So twitter.com slash Mayo Clinic slash asterisk is going to give me any URL that's been archived on this archiver um, that begins with that stub of a URL. Um, and uh, when I search, I can see that there are actually quite a few tweets from the Mayo Clinic that have been archived over time. And right at the top there is one of the most recent is this actual tweet. So this is actually authoritative evidence that the Mayo Clinic did tweet this at that time on that day. Um, and it also documents some of the responses to that. Uh, they then um, deleted it. They haven't, I don't think, said why or how uh, it came to be deleted. Um, you can also use the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine. So if you go to web.archive.org, this is another um, popular uh, archiver. Uh, the Internet Archive has a number of great resources if you're, if you're digging into things that uh, have been published or broadcast online. And you can see that uh, similarly, a number of Mayo Clinic tweets have been archived and it has a, a date and timestamp of its own. Um, so I want to make the case that uh, actually archiving these, these kinds of things is uh, an important contribution that people can make. If you see a problematic tweet, if you see a controversial tweet, uh, if you see an offensive tweet or, or, or something, documenting it can help fact checkers behind you. So even if you don't go through and do the entire fact check, if you can document that, the, that an account has actually shared something problematic, it leaves a trail for researchers then. Disinformation researchers and fact checkers are going to look for evidence that that was posted um, before it's, you know, after it's deleted, they're going to go look for it. And if you can help uh, provide that record, that's actually a service. So that's something that, you know, I think it's important for all of us to know how to do, but also to, to convey to students. Um, Sunshine, do we have questions about archivers before we move on here? One question, and I'll only ask one because you still have three more skills to go here. Um, and that is, someone said that they use both archive.org um, based in, I assume this is San Francisco, and archive.is, but they've wondered about who is behind archive.is. They go on, I haven't been able to find any info on that, and the site appears to be based in Russia. Should we have any concerns about using archivers that aren't transparent? That's an interesting question. Um, 
Yes, I would say if, if, if they're not transparent, I know that a number of, of fact checkers and, and you know, standards-based journalists use archive.is and that it has held up actually in court, as has, I think, the, the Wayback Machine to prove that something was posted at a given time. Um, I am not entirely sure where it's hosted or who owns archive.is. That's a good question. Uh, thank you for raising that, though. I will look into that myself. Other questions about archivers you want me to move um, on here? Uh, there's one more, uh, okay. which is how do archivers decide what to record? For example, are they storing all Mayo Clinic tweets or is there some kind no. of system? So there's a system. So when somebody actually submits a URL and archives it, it's saved, but it, it's user saved. So they are not archiving the entire internet. Nobody has that kind of capacity. Um, Tweets of public officials are archived and saved. Um, Trump's tweets, for example, there are several uh, archives, fact-based, the Trump Twitter archive, archive everything that Trump tweets. Um, ProPublica runs a, runs a website called PolitWhoops um, that documents tweets that public officials delete, state representatives, I think, and then members of Congress and uh, the president and others. So, uh, there are sites that archive specific people and their activity on Twitter, on social media. Otherwise, it's up to users to document it. So that's why I was saying it's, imp it's important for people to document things they find that they think are problematic or important to have a record of before they're deleted, if they think it's likely that they might be. Okay, uh, carry on, please. Okay, so great. So the third skill I want to talk about is something called critical observation. This is, is largely a common sense skill, but uh, it, it, it's worth pointing out. I'm going to use a resource from an organization called First Draft to teach this. First Draft actually trains journalists in digital verification skills, but I think some of their resources have a great cross purpose for educators uh, using with students. Um, so here you have an example of First Draft's observation challenge. And the goal here is to just use your, your eyes uh, and, uh, uh, and your brain to um, figure out what country this is in. And they will give you hints if you, if you click there. Um, but, and if we were in an open chat environment, I would elicit uh, details that you might notice. But usually when I talk through this with groups, uh, you know, people's eyes go to the center of the photo right away. They see a Star of David, they see the word Gaza. Um, and then somebody typically suggests that this is possibly in the Middle East. Other people then will notice the way people are dressed. Um, uh, it looks like it's, it's far colder than it ever gets in the Middle East, even in the, even in the, the dead of winter there. Um, so then other people then start to look in the background and they see evidence of Western European architecture. Some people look at the flags, but again, this is a demonstration of protest, so the flags may not be a reliable signal. And finally, people see that there is French uh, on, the, on the banner that's being held uh, on the sheet and then in the background, uh, a French publication, La Humanité, uh, and then there's French language there, uh, all pointing to, to uh, the fact that this was taken in France uh, at a protest uh, in France. Um, they have another example here, and again, people might immediately notice um, the Mandarin characters on signs, but also there is English, and once people begin to look closer, they see uh, that there are license plates on the cars. They begin to notice addresses. There are telephone numbers and you can clearly see an area code 212 uh, right on the right hand side at the very edge on that orange uh, banner or orange uh, uh, awning. Uh, and then on other awnings and signs there as well. So this is Chinatown uh, in New York City. So um, we just sort of put together this quick graphic for, for this uh, talk uh, or for this training that, that we do with educators to try to help students think about these types of, of uh, aspects of images when they encounter them. So don't just take in an image and then think that it counts as evidence uh, that it says it is where, you know, that it, that it is where it says it is, like the, like the image of the alleged image of London I shared up top, but really scrutinize the image, look at the architecture, look at the way people are dressed, look for other signs and signals of climate any visible text, especially business names or phone numbers or street names and addresses, municipal signs, license plates. And you can help students practice these skills um, with examples of misinformation like this one, but you can also uh, help students practice these skills uh, on your own with, with images you take um, and then ask them if they, can, if they can use their observation skills to figure out where you are. Um, obviously, you can see here when they pivot uh, and use your observation skills a bit, um, that 
there is a mountain range in the background there. So, you know, you could look to see if there are any mountain ranges like that near London uh, and, and begin to draw that into question just using observation skills. Um, here's an image I took uh, in, in my neighborhood. Um, and the goal here is to really have students, um, when they see an image like this, to really notice details like this. So there's a bus route, there's an architectural flourish on the top of that building that's pretty distinctive. There's a business, there are a couple of business names in the shot, there are license plates, there's a cab company. So if we were to zoom up and magnify any of these, we can get a business name and then do a lateral search and we can be pretty confident about where this is, but we have to just learn to look at images like that. Um, so that's the third skill. Um, and then Sunshine, I'm happy to pivot straight into the fourth if you, just to yep. save some time here. That's a good idea. Great. So um, some of you may have heard of reverse image searching. Uh, others um, maybe have not, um, uh, but it's possible to, to search the web uh, for an image instead of just a text-based search term. So digital images are really nothing more than um, patterns of pixels. Uh, and so this image is no exception. So if I wanted to search the web for this image of the protester holding the doctored sign, to find out if it was authentic, to see where else on the web this image occurs. And I'm using Chrome. Uh, Chrome makes this very easy because it's Google's browser. I can right click and move down to search Google for image. And my search results will be uh, either similar images or identical images. So here I can see that same image. Now I have had the authentic version. Here's the Orange County Register. I see a link from Snopes that has that same image. So it has uh, moved through and, and uh, Google reverse image search has looked for that pixel pattern published elsewhere online. And it gets me very quickly to uh, authoritative, um, credible sources on this particular image. So again, this Snopes entry will tell me uh, why it's a doctored image and, and link to the original. And the original image is in this uh, gallery on the Orange County Register uh, website. So it was actually taken by an Orange, Orange County Register photojournalist. And here it is on that site. Um, so now we have more information uh, uh, in the caption there. And we'll talk about that uh, in just a minute. So the way, other ways you can do a reverse image search, if you're not a Chrome user and you don't want to use it out of the right-click menu, you can go straight to images.google.com and click on the camera. And then you can either copy the image address out of the right-click menu and paste that into this, this field, the paste image URL, or you can actually save a copy of the image to your hard drive and upload it as a file and do a reverse image, do a reverse image search that way. Um, there are also reverse image search engines at uh, tineye.com is another example, and then yandex.com uh, uh, is another. So sometimes it takes multiple searches across various uh, reverse image search engines to find the source of a photo, um, but that's important to, to, to know about those, those methods. Um, it can be a very powerful way to debunk uh, photos out of context or photos that have been doctored. There's also a, a great extension called the InVid Fake Video News Debunker that gives you um, a range of options out of your right-click menu uh, so you can search these different reverse search uh, engines um, with a single click. Um, on a right click. Um, and there are other extensions as well that, that you can use in your browser that, uh, uh, that do this very well. Sometimes it's necessary to uh, do a partial screenshot of an image. So here's an example of a false meme uh, about, um, you know, migrants, quote, diluting America. So you have some white supremacist, white nationalist language here. This account has since been suspended. Um, but if I do a reverse image search of this image, I just get this same meme over and over again. So I want the photo that's in the meme. So I need to actually snip out a piece of it, save it to my hard drive, uh, and then search that. So Windows has a native snipping tool to do a partial screenshot. You can also do one on a Mac. And then I can start to get to uh, uh, more authoritative sources. The Daily Mail is a, a British tabloid, but it does have some additional information uh, here about this image and where it was taken that I can use as the basis for more searching. Uh, and it has a date as well. Um, so this is telling me that these are Syrian refugees in a Greek refugee camp. And I can take that and use the date and do some lateral searching and find the image elsewhere. Um, I'm not familiar with FNAC.com, but I do have a photo credit now and the name of an AP photographer. And then I can use that to find the image 
somewhere where I'm more comfortable that, you know, that has standards uh, and that is captioning it the same way. So if I can find this on the AP site, then, then I've really gotten all the way to the source of the image. Um, so uh, reverse image search can be a, a really powerful tool, especially in combination with some of these other skills. Um, Sunshine, do you want me to, to pause for more questions here throughout or just save them for the end here? Let's save them for the end at this point. Okay, okay. So geolocation is the last uh, skill. And again, I'm going to show you what First Draft offers here in the way of resources. It's basically a tutorial of how to use Google Street View. Many of you have probably used Google Street View that if you zoom up on a Google map, you can actually drop into the map and navigate around. This particular challenge just asks you to find the last word in this mural, um, which is a relatively straightforward thing to do. And then it gets harder from there. Um, but again, even though this was created for journalists, uh, it's a great tool to use with students. You can also look at previous captures. So if we wanted to see, for example, when this mural was painted, I can drop that menu down out of the top left and see that the mural uh, appears for a period of time and then was painted over in no by November 2018. So you can get rough date ranges that help you match details in backgrounds of images if you're trying to figure out when uh, a, a given photo uh, was taken which can be very helpful. So I can show you what a reverse image search uh, of this. Uh, uh, we already looked at what a reverse image search of this image, uh, this photo looks like. Uh, and we got to the Orange County Register by doing a little bit of lateral reading. Um, so now let's use geolocation and say, I, I just want to make sure that this is in fact at the corner of Main Street and Walnut Avenue in Huntington Beach. As the Orange County Register says, I can actually check that. So I go to Google Maps and zoom right down on that intersection. And I can grab this little orange figurine here in the bottom. And when I do that, all the streets that have been captured by Google Street View light up in blue. And I can actually look at this intersection and make sure that it is in fact where um, this protest happened, where that woman was standing with the sign. Uh, and it matches here. You can see all the indicators that we are at the right intersection. So there's no question that that photo was taken at that intersection in Huntington Beach. Um, and so you can layer geolocation on top of a reverse image search, lateral searching and move to geolocation to, to prove things beyond a doubt. So to the person who asked the question, what do I do with someone who doubts Snopes? You can engage some of these skills and show them beyond a doubt when and where something came from. This same example of the, of the Boise uh, of the image, sorry about the audio, uh, of this, uh, uh, um, Bernie Sanders uh, rally in Boise, uh, if I really want to prove that this was Boise, um, I don't have to trust the person who posted this to YouTube. We can actually uh, do a reverse image search of a video still um, and get to some other instances of that. And that will take me um, to some other videos. Uh, this is the, actually the same video. Later in the video, uh, she talks to uh, a Bernie staffer uh, or campaign uh, supporter. Um, and in the background, you can see if you engage a little bit of critical observation, again, combining these skills, you see some pretty distinctive buildings um, there. So that's one visual clue. And if we do some lateral reading, we can find out that that Bernie rally or that Bernie march uh, ended at Ann Morrison Park. So we know that the video was taken in a park uh, and Ann Morrison Park is in Boise. So now if we can find those buildings uh, in and around Ann Morrison Park, in Boise, we've definitively proved that that video was not Lansing, Michigan. Uh, if anyone still believed it was, and they don't want to believe the fact checkers. And if we just kind of look at the perimeter of Ann Morrison Park, we can look for a, a point where there might be some apartments. Um, so Morrison Park apartments look like a likely subject to me. And sometimes this takes some doing. Um, but again, this can be a fun, really engaging challenge. If you're working with students, it can be a fun, engaging challenge among friends uh, and family too. Can you geolocate this? Can you see where this was? And if you zoom up, you can see here that we found the buildings in the background. So that rally uh, or that march ended in this park right about in that location uh, in the park. Um, and so there are ways to, to do this. And once you begin uh, you know, applying these skills, um, you can see the possibilities. The same goes for this. Uh, you know, there's a business name. Uh, if we do a little bit of lateral reading, first of all, if we read the comments, somebody has commented uh, where this is located and to Google that and you'll see where this is. Um, 
but we can also do a, a quick lateral search for the name of this bakery uh, in Selayang Baru, and then use Street View to, to prove beyond a doubt uh, that that's where that was shot. So this, this is not London because I can show you the storefront in Malaysia in this town um, right here on that intersection. And again, sometimes it takes a little looking around, um, but you can get uh, definitively to, to the, uh, the location uh, and absolutely prove that this, this was not London. Um, so again, for people who are reluctant to believe fact checkers, you can employ these skills and say, look, it's right here. There's the bakery. This happened in Malaysia. It's not in London. Nobody's locking down for 5G in London uh, and disprove that. So again, I think there's a, a really um, big case to be made for these skills uh, you know, in the hands of, of ordinary folks online to, to help fact checkers do their jobs. Um, we all have a role to play here in cleaning up the information environment. Um, it, when you get the slides, you'll see some other sources of folks who use this kind of thing. This verification handbook was just published at datajournalism.com. That's a great guide uh, to some of the skills and more that I mentioned. Uh, and again, I have some slides about resources from the News Literacy Project uh, that you can check out when you get the deck, but I wanna go ahead and wrap up so I can get to your questions. Uh, we do have a virtual uh, classroom with e-learning uh, assets there, including a check center that has some missions for students. So if you're looking to engage students around these, definitely check out uh, Checkology and the check center. Uh, we can make sure to get you those uh, as well. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. That was so uh, comprehensive for such a short period of time. Um, okay, so we don't have much time left. So I'm going to ask you some kind of broader questions that came up. One is, um, in your experience, what do you see as most challenging for students when learning about effective fact checking skills? Sorry, what do I see as a challenge for students? As, as the most challenging aspects of this for students when, when yeah. teaching or learning about fact checking skills. I think just, just taking the time. Um, you know, one advantage I think that, that this has with students is that it's, it's super engaging. So to, it's kind of like solving a mystery. Um, it might very well be hard to get students interested in talking about a lockdown in Malaysia as a current event. But if you start with a video that says it's in London and then you get them hooked on trying to solve that mystery, um, then naturally they might want to know, okay, well, why is there razor wire in this town in Malaysia? And then you're really engaging the event itself. So I think that's a way to overcome that hesitancy is to pose it like a challenge, pose it like a contest, uh, and then challenge them to get better and better at it. Um, and now let's take a step back and think about this a little more broadly. Um, how can we approach apathy toward committing to this news literacy process more generally? Um, someone writes, they have found some yeah. of their students and adult friends yeah. who lack the care to participate in this disciplined process. Yeah, I think that's the danger, right, is that um, people don't know what to believe, so they choose to believe nothing. Um, I think we have to, especially as educators, we have to push back against um, cynical notions that, you know, that nothing is credible, uh, that credible information doesn't exist, that the truth is unknowable, that uh, facts are, un, you know, impossible to determine for sure. Uh, the notion that everybody has some kind of agenda uh, some sort of ulterior motive with what they publish and create. This is not true. And it's actually really disempowering for students as individuals. And it's completely, you know, toxic to democracy. Um, so if we don't have a basis for, for a common set of facts, we don't have a basis for, for public policy and for, for a national conversation. And so helping students understand the stakes of that cynicism and to work away from it toward a very savvy, nuanced, healthy, skepticism that's empowered by these skills, I think is, is, is vital. Great. And then one last question, which um, was posted early on in the, in the conversation today. What role do you see for academic librarians in this fight? We have been in the mm. trenches as fact checkers for decades. And yeah. I wonder if you, so if the News Literacy Project works with librarians in any capacity, that would be helpful to share. Or if you have broader thoughts, that would also be great. Yeah, I mean, I think that our trainings uh, are generally pretty popular with librarians, both school-based librarians and public librarians. I think they have a tremendous role to play right now um, uh, as the information landscape evolves and explodes. Um, to help sort of guide people back. You know, I think public librarians can host events and have trainings and, and try to help uh, their patrons understand, uh, you know, how, to, how not to fall for misinformation and help people understand that misinformation is actually designed to exploit them 
It's designed to exploit their deepest values. It's designed to exploit their religious faith, their patriotism, whatever it might be. And nobody wants to be exploited. Um, and, and I think for school-based librarians, it's the same thing. I mean, um, you know, really helping people understand uh, why it's important uh, not to fall for misinformation, how it can impact them personally, their families, their communities, and, and the country and the world uh, around them. Um, and I, you're right. I mean, I think uh, librarians also have a unique role to play with faculty um, who may need some of these skills as well and some training. And I think, you know, middle school and high school librarians, the same to train, train some of their colleagues and talk to them about these skills and, and resources. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Peter Adams from the News Literacy Project. We really appreciate your time today and your expertise. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us today, and we hope that you will join us for the final webinar in this series next Tuesday, May 5th, also at 1 p.m., where we will talk about combating misinformation through a deeper discussion of scientific uncertainty, which is a major challenge, uh, especially at this moment, and um, we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye.